Right, good morning everybody and thank you for uh, inviting me to come along. I think um, I'm speaking on behalf of ARM and I hope most of you will have some knowledge about ARM uh, but I'll touch on what ARM is uh, along the way just to make sure that's not going to fall out. Oh. Right, moving smartly onward then. Um, we're talking about uh, embedded systems, but I want to really make the point embedded systems today are not the same as they were a little while ago. So I'm just going to, to look at these. These are the sort of electronic systems that, uh, that you encounter all around you today. These are the ones that you know, and these are the ones that you love. Because you know and love them, they're important to you. Uh, there is a whole bunch of other ones, however. Uh, the invisible face of electronic systems, and these are in fact much more numerous, uh, they're much more important because these are actually holding up the fabric of society. And whereas it may be inconvenient if you uh, lost your, your camera or your smartphone, if you lose a big security system or the banking system, uh, of course we have no experience of, uh, of losing banking systems recently, do we? Uh, then you know how painful things can be. And, and it is so many different aspects of life which are actually supported these days by electronic systems, which is why I put this cup of tea at the bottom. Because it really really is something which has got negligible value and yet if you think of the logistics of bringing that together at a, a, effectively a disposable cost, the logistics of that is actually supported by the electronic systems that we know and love and don't notice. So electronic systems are the 21st century version of what we were calling the embedded, the embedded systems before. These are really complex things. Now. We live very close with this. I'm not sure how many of you are hands-on technologists, but most of you would recognize or at least have heard of Moore's Law. Moore's Law, this doubling equation, which has worked throughout pretty well my lifetime in this space for the last nearly 40 years. We are certainly getting towards the end of it, but we tend to forget a couple of things because we live so close to it. So ARM, when it was formed back in 1991, an average integrated circuit had about a million transistors on it. Today, for five euros or thereabouts, you can buy a memory card which has got 20 billion transistors on it. It's a huge increase in capacity. It's 20,000 times more capacity, broadly speaking, on a chip since ARM was founded only 23 years ago. The product that we were designing our component for is very different to the product which is, which is being made and being used in systems today. Now the other thing is, people don't buy electronics. They don't buy hardware or software, they buy a product. And products, thing, a thing like this, a smartphone, they embody lots and lots of technologies. Not just the digital design and the embedded software. There is around 20 chips inside a smartphone. But there is also analog, mechanics, plastics, glass, micro-machines, the little vibration motor which is in there, which is quite an achievement in itself. The displays and transducers, the robotics associated with its manufacture and assembly and the test technologies, not just the test of the physical thing when it's created, but the test technologies of the components as they're being put together. It's a huge, huge task to create these things. Knowledge and know-how we mustn't exclude. The reason that people don't go into these businesses is partly because they don't have the background, and we'll come back to that. So there are many specialists and business contributions round and round the world and it's not anymore about individual hardware and software skills, but about being part of a global team to deliver these working systems. So it's not just individuals as in individual people, it's individuals as in individual companies. So even companies who have experience in this area are not big enough to take on the whole challenge. Now just to give you some idea, this is the um, what would, call, would be called a motherboard inside a PC, it's the, uh, um, the control board inside the iPhone. To give you an idea of the scale of it, that's, that's it. It's got 20 chips on it, all sorts of things. Samsung for memory, analog codec, magnetic sensors, touch screen controllers and mobile DDR memory, RF filters, uh, invisible components include OS drivers, stacks, uh, the, all of these things go into that product 
And it's not just that side, it's a double-sided board. And you can see then, all of these things have had to be designed by somebody. They've, they've come together in this product, but it's certainly not a phone with a chip in it, which tends to be the image that people have of smartphones and the technology. Now I've identified throughout this these things called ARM partners. And the, the reason I've done this is that we're an IP contributor. We, put, we contribute to people who are making complex electronic systems. And we don't actually know how many of them are using ARM technology inside these chips. So they may or may not be using our technology in there. We only know that they're an ARM partner or a licensee and we know that we get revenue from them, royalties and, and so on. But we don't know on an individual product basis how or, how or what of our products are used inside these chips. So it looks, so when you look at a product like this, we can't say how many ARM chips there are, how many ARM processors there are in it. But it's likely to be quite a few. Moving on, if it will let me. Oh yes, there we go. Um, so now the, I'm going to go back because I think I missed one in that little in exchange. Oh no, it didn't. Um, the processor chip, which is the the fella here circled in red, uh, is the probably the biggest chip in there. But this isn't the actual one. This is a, uh, a Tegra, Nvidia Tegra chip, which we know contains five ARM CPUs and we know is around a billion transistors. But just to give you an idea of the scale of this thing. You know, this is three transistors, and this is the amount of interconnect that's necessary to connect those three transistors into something meaningful. Can you imagine a billion transistors and the complication associated with, with creating that? That chip is too complex for any individual to make. It has to make use of substantial reuse as the only me method to get the productivity levels high enough, which is why things like ARM IP becomes an important building block of a complex system. <clears throat> Even inside the chip package, and just to illustrate here that there's more technology than the technology associated with integrated circuits, even inside the chip package, so this is a cross section of the integrated circuit, the A4 package, and you can see here is the processor die, and up above are two memory chips. That is quite an, a technical achievement in itself, and it involves people who have specialist knowledge in that area to be able to put that degree of sophistication into one, pro one chip, which is hardly noticeable inside the smartphone, which most people don't think of as even having it inside. It's just a sealed glass polished object. <clears throat> So lots and lots of designers. Now Apple, who are not really very um, communicative about many things, back in 2011 were challenged by the, uh, by the US government to disclose, to disclose some of the, uh, the partners that they had, the contributors into their product. And they listed 159 tier one suppliers for their products. So these are people who are supplying components into their range of products. So it's not just the iPhone, but it's fairly well the same, the same community. Thousands of designers, clearly, tens of thousands of engineers, and they're global. This is a, a product which on the back says, designed in California, manufactured in China. But in point of fact, it's a, it's a product which is made of components which come from everywhere. Uh, and incidentally, ARM isn't on that supply list. What's going on, surely? We don't supply components, you see. We supply knowledge which goes into components. So we are actually a tier two supplier. So you can imagine how many other tier two suppliers there are that don't appear on there. So there are hundreds more who are actually involved in this. Supply chains were the term that people were using. Products, chips, predominantly had supply chains. Products, arguably, have supply chains. These days they're using the term supply networks. And you can see why. It's like ARM supplies not just to, uh, to Apple, but to NVIDIA and to uh, uh, the world's list of electronics le uh, product leaders. So I can't go through them all without actually disclosing information which would be, which would be confidential, of course. 
Now, undoubtedly markets provide the growth drivers for, uh, for this technology. <clears throat> and there's no doubt about it that IoT will be the, be the dominant thing we hear in the next 10 or so years. But what we have to remember is these other markets haven't gone away. So there is a job, there is, a, there is an opportunity, a commercial opportunity in mainframe. You're not surprised about that. The numbers are not actually that high. But nevertheless, there are people who design, do design roles which fit into mainframe applications. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised to find that um, ARM as an IP component um, is being considered by some people for putting into a HPC machine. Uh, high performance computing and the technology which is essentially low power, low performance for inclusion in smartphones and other embedded applications. Uh, it doesn't really seem that they mix, but it does. The real domain is still that wide. It's just that the Internet of Things is going to be the largest volume aspect which appears on the top. The other thing to bear in mind is that these are marketing classifications. These are not real jobs. These are not what businesses do. They're what markets are retrospectively looked at and collected and valued. And it's an important thing to, to spot the difference. I'm pleased to see that uh, somebody turned up on, uh, on Skype, which is really good news. <coughs> So, undoubtedly we need lots more engineers and, sci and scientists, but I'm afraid the scale isn't obvious to me at all. See, I've seen figures which suggest that there may be, we, we may be going to see shortages of a couple of billion engineers by the time we get to 2020. It's big enough to be terrifying, but it's actually too big to resolve organically. 2020 is not very far away. And so what are we going to do? Is the whole thing going to fall down? Well, the answer is no. Because you have to remember that 20,000 times more complexity. Well, in fact, I've been a little bit more modest here, and I've called it 1,000. Um, there are some reasons behind that, because I was comparing ASIC with, with memory, which is not exactly a fair comparison. But it's at least 1,000 times. I'm now being accused by some other people incidentally of saying that a thousand isn't enough, so you can't win on this kind of thing. Um, but we have increased productivity, designer productivity, in excess of a thousand times in the last 20 years. We haven't noticed that we've done that. We've been fighting with lots of things, we've been scurrying around doing things, but actually if you go back 20 years, people were not doing embedded systems with much software in them. It was essentially hardware with a bit of software stuck on the outside. The, the breakthrough that ARM brought to the technology at that point was being able to put a computer into an ASIC to allow the, soft, the team of designers to include some software engineers. It was a productivity thing. Um, nowadays, we're so used to seeing it, we don't question it anymore. But the systems have become vastly more complicated. So I believe that we will see ways to make our engineers a thousand times more productive as well. So we will still have a shortage, I have no doubt. But it will be a shortage which is of the same scale, moderate to severe, as it is today. It's not going to be desperate, but we do need, and it is a good opportunity, for employment and prospects. But the other thing is, it also shows that this, this is not a static job. Whatever you do when you come out of university and go into the world of, uh, of products and product development, then you will know inside the first 20 odd years, it's going to go through radical change. It's not what you know now, it's what you will know then. And so don't expect that this is going to be a job of, of um, uh, consistency, boring regularity. This is an exciting ride. Uh, believe me, I'm getting towards the end of it and I'm starting to miss it already. <clears throat> but it is true that nations who develop their own engineers and scientists will have the best opportunity to keep them. Now this is an interesting one. The best opportunity to keep them doesn't actually always follow through into the, uh, into the reality of keeping them. And so I think we have to look at engineers and scientists not just from the point of view of a single investment, but of a continuous investment. They're part of the economy and a very much more important part of the economy than most people realize. So we know that system chips are getting ever more complex. Uh, people today require a supercomputer in their pocket 
in comparison to what was possible to do just a few years ago. And arms technology essentially makes it practical to deliver that. It's a, I'm not sort of putting arm up as an example of wonderful, um, just to illustrate the point that what we're doing here is allowing people to design complex systems without having to get into too much technical detail themselves. They can abstract away from large chunks of that detail. They can use and reuse things which have gone before. A feature that happened in ARM timescale, which, is, which was um, a fundamental problem to us getting going, was when ARM started, we had, uh, people had no concept of reuse. A chip was a complete entity. You designed it from scratch in the beginning, and when you did another one, you designed that one from scratch as well. The idea of reusing a design from one design to another, or indeed reusing somebody else's component, was really, really hard to overcome. Uh, we have to uh, do systems like this when you're looking at uh, a typical processor back uh, now now a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a, a design start that we offer so when, when we license our, uh, our products to people they have a, 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 an example design that they can take components out of and add components onto. And here is the, uh, the design start kit for a 10 processor uh, IC. A lot of our customers would have taken that and essentially added the things that they wanted on the chip and put that onto a chip. This represents not a whole chip, but a quarter of a chip. And of course a diminishing part of the chip as the processes get smaller, because today's pl platforms have around 20 processes in that space. Now it's okay to put 20 processes onto a piece of silicon, but unless you can use it, unless you can use them, they're just occupying space. The idea is you're putting 20 processes on there because you want to achieve something that can't be achieved with 10 or with 18. And at the same time you have to be concerned with other non-functional parameters like power and performance uh, because people want to use these in devices and in situations where there isn't an awful lot of room or there isn't an awful lot of power and so they uh, they have to make considerations to the methodology which is going to be used in this as well so arm delivers improved productivity improved time to market and improved quality and certainty when you're making a complex system you don't want it to go wrong it may sound a stupid thing to say, but if you're making a smartphone, or you're making a tablet, or you're making an engine management system, if your product doesn't work first time, frequently you've lost the market. People talk about losing 10 or 15% of the market if you're not there at the beginning. The reality is these days, if you're not there, somebody else is, they get the market henceforth, you've lost it. So it's, uh, it really does matter very hard limits to get your product out first. You can't afford to be second in most of this business. Now I said it's not all about the CPUs and I think this is an important point to get over. We are an IP company, the image is about CPUs, but actually there's all of this lot as well. CPUs and GPUs. We also do the graphical processing units. Software. Increasingly this is a, a, a large part of what we do not only of what the product is. Um, <clears throat> interconnect subsystems. It's not just necessary to have the components. You have to know how to connect them together. We need the processors, but we need the interrupt controllers. We need the bus structure, which will enable you to connect them together. The I.O. devices, the memory interfaces, all of those components have to come from somewhere. They're all designed, and increasingly, we need to have models. A mathematical model, call it software if you will, I'll call it ma uh, exercising mathematics. That has to be created as well because customers don't always want to design their systems using in individual transistor level simulations. Physical IP, uh, we do the cell libraries which a lot of uh, the world's silicon fabs use for their process development and we give them away. We give them away because they don't actually want to design cell libraries themselves, there's no value in it for them. But actually, if we can get our cell libraries into their process development, then it means that our products will be more optimized towards their processes when they're created. So that means our customers are going to be happier. So we design cell libraries and we give them away. It's an entire loss leader, and yet it's an important part of developing the market. And of course, we don't just do a lot of these things in isolation. So there are operating system vendors, and there's debuggers, and there's uh, platform providers. 
uh, there's people who do training and there are uh, people who are uh, literally manufacturing the, the devices at the end of the day and all of these effectively are part of the ARM partnership so we have to be compatible with them it's no use in saying that uh, you know, we have these models and we have this capability but it's incompatible with the design tools that everybody is using and so this integration is an important part of the roles that we under, ha have to undertake inside ARM. Well, the right horse for the right course, of course, we provide a processor, uh, accepting the fact that there might be a, 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 a DSP processor. Well, the reality is quite a lot from that. That's the A15 core. It's not actually the very latest one. The A25 is the latest, which is the 64-bit core. But this one is shown here as having a cluster of four CPUs in it. It's only possible to start to fill chips when you start to use clusters. Of course, you've got to be able to use them in, in some kind of way. But people are using clusters of clusters. Here's the Mali, the Mali uh, DSP processor, which has got a variable number of shader cores, and again, can be used in a cluster configuration. Um, but the thing that we also have are these very, very little cores, the M series cores. Um, these are the ones which are used for controllers, very much the low end. So if you've got a thermostat or something, um, you know, an infrared controller or a TV controller, it might very well be controlled by an M series core. These are very much simpler. And in fact, to give you some idea of scale, that's about 50,000 transistors and the other ones are about 50 million. So there's quite a range of design challenges involved in creating even the CPUs. It means that we have 24 processors in six families which all have to be maintained and designed and be made compatible with the design environment. And supported is the important word. No use having the core if people can't use it. Now what it means to us as a company, and it's really the only thing that I will say about ARM as headlines, we shipped 10 billion CPUs in 2013. That was 20% more than we shipped the previous year, and current plans are we're going to be shipping 20% more next year. This is how fast the market is growing. 10 billion, and yet we don't make any. We don't do a single whole chip design. We don't make any complete designs. We don't make chips for smartphones, which the media will tell you about. Uh, all of those things. All we're providing is a lump of knowledge and know-how the CPU is an important part of it, but so is that whole environment to make it usable. We're shipping that to enable people to develop complex systems, chips perhaps for use in complex systems, depending on who the customers are, and we're helping them with their productivity and their reuse. They're able to move their designs from their previous generation to their next generation, and that's a very important thing for them to do. Uh, so we achieved our $1 billion US dollar revenue last year, 30% uh, 30, 30 of it is spent on R&D. Now it makes us a very unusual company to be spending that much on R&D. And if you look at our uh, uh, skills profile, 90% of ARMS employees have got a first degree or higher, 60% have got a higher degree. Now that's pretty unusual for industry. Uh, it's more normal uh, configuration for academic institutions. But it does reflect the nature of the thing that we produce. We don't have a factory, therefore we're not using a lot of uh, semi-skilled labor. We, we're using skilled people, people who have knowledge in specific areas, focusing on those areas, delivering as a part of this team which is delivering this capability, which is a part of what goes into a chip, which is a part of which goes into a system. You know, this is, it is a complex thing, it's a network. <clears throat> Interestingly, oh, I was going to say 2,800 people, so we're not a big company. 28 offices worldwide. It's a lot of spread for a little company. But actually, in, t in terms of design offices, there's about seven. Uh, but we have serious design offices in, uh, in Austin and in the UK and several places in Europe um, and one in, China, uh, one in Taiwan and one in India. So, I mean, these are there in, in those particular locations because of particular advantages that were offered at that time, usually because of the links they had with the local university. Now, that's a, an interesting uh, development because here was a university which had an idea, and I'll take Norway as an example, Trondheim. Uh, here was a uh, university that was fairly advanced in terms of graphics processing and rendering. And, uh, and so they kicked off a startup, 
the startup had um, enough success that they were starting to be able to sell their their uh, hardware for people who wanted that kind of sophistication in their embedded systems, and we acquired it as a uh, as a running company, a going concern, and we've developed it where it is. So it's now, I think, nearly three times the size it was when we took it over, and it's still in Trondheim. And the university links are stronger than ever. So this is a good illustration of how this, this uh, new glo global ecosystem works. Similar stories exist in, uh, in Austin and in India. Um, so I've talked around this. I mean, this is a very, very exciting technology, and it's everywhere, and it's in everybody's lives. But do those people value it? Now there's, a, there's a, um, uh, a body in the UK called Engineering UK, it's actually funded by the government and it does um, a certain amount of research on essentially what, what, graduation, what uh, graduate subjects are being taken in engineering, what happens to the engineers, what salaries do they get, that kind of thing. And at the beginning of it they always do some kind of focal sur focus survey. And this particular year, they decided to do one on the perception of engineering. And they, uh, they asked this fairly simple question, uh, which I guess you've all read, so I don't need to read it out right by now. Um, and I think it's, it looks fairly positive, because it says that 92% of men, 84% of women, thought that, think that engineering is important. I think that's, that's a good start. The worrying one was the, this part. However, when asked what engineering developments in the last 50 years had had significant impact on their lives, 50 to 60% of people couldn't name one. Any engineering thing that had, been, that had happened to them which was impacting their lives in the last 50 years and they couldn't think of one. Now this says to me a really worrying thing. You know, engineering is good and it's valuable but actually we've not a clue what they do. Uh, and you have to think about that. That is us failing to communicate. It's nothing else. We have, we have used our technology. We've said, we'll give you exciting things. Because you got those exciting things from us, then you will value us, won't you? The answer is no. It will cease to notice you, is, the, is what, will hap what will happen. And the more sophisticated we make the interface, the less we are noticeable. So the, the iPhone, which looks like it's carved out of solid volcanic glass, with a, with a stainless steel band around the outside, as far as Joe Public is concerned, that's what it is. It's a lump of solid glass. And the, it, the images and icons, they're created by the magicians in China who, who take this glass and they go abracadabra, and the, and the whole thing happens in some way. It's indistinguishable from magic. And that brings me to my next point, because... It is actually a tremendously exciting thing that we do. We take a stone and we take it apart and we align and we assemble all of the atoms. We select the ones that we want to use and we, and we create things like that out of it. Now, that's very, very exciting. How can we fail to explain how exciting that is to people? And yet we do because we don't bother to. It's dependent on mathematics, physics, and chemistry. These are subjects which are really struggling in the education environment at the moment because nobody understands how these are in any way relevant to products. You know, these are people who just do sums for the fun of it or build great big holes somewhere here in Switzerland and they fill it full of expensive equipment and then try and create black holes so that the, uh, the press can worry about how it's uh, going to suck up the whole universe. I mean, these are... These are effectively island technologies. We understand what they are, but we are very few in number. It's very important for society then to realize that although what we do is very clever, and this is tricky because it's, it's always hard to say to somebody, we're clever. Because going along with that is the assumption that you're not. <laughs> okay? But nevertheless, we have got to say something like that. We have to say, this is very clever, but it's not actually magic. 
It's not easy to make a, uh, 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 an iPhone. It needs thousands of people working all around the world, assembling all of them with specialist knowledge. Some of them are taking apart the stone. Some of them are reassembling it into, into a chip. Some of them are reassembling it into plastic of the case. Some of them are reassembling it into the printed circuit boards. It's not magic. It's painful. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of effort and it's not static. <coughs> But we, we, we have this one, which is Arthur C. Clarke, I uh, guess most of you have heard of him, but he's a science author, and he made a, a, a quote a while ago that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and this is definitely where, it, where we're at, and this is the worrying consequence of it. Ergo, its practitioners are indistinguishable from magicians, okay? <laughs> So we're magicians, as far as the public is concerned, and we've got to do something to dispel that image. Because ma magic is easy. We've seen it on Harry Potter. You know, it's easy to do, it's easy to make something fly, it's easy to make something animated. That's magic, and that's the advantages of magic. Politicians say, we already know how to design phones. There's no more ne investment necessary. We've lost the market because California is where they design them, China is where they make them. That's it. End of story. That magic is lost. They don't realize that the, con the technology continues to advance. We have to do work on it. And we're part of a global team. It's not just about doing it in Switzerland or in Europe. It's in the world. The thing that makes ARM successful is not that it's in the UK. It's actually in the world. It really annoys people that half a percent of our revenue comes from the UK. Only 5% of it comes from Europe. They want to know why it isn't bigger. The answer is, the world is where our market is, not in any one of those places. And there's a lot of businesses like Arm, not the same scale that it may be, who are offering their services throughout the world as part of the supply network. So, the threshold of magic then. This is, this is my term. Everybody has a threshold of magic beyond which observed functionality is indistinguishable from magic. So we're not uh, isolated from this ourselves. There are things that we don't understand, even if we're technicians. Uh, we, we don't understand how chemical systems work, biological systems, economic systems. I wonder whether anybody actually understands how economic systems work. Um, uh, but we do have some knowledge in electronic systems. But those areas are things that just work. I mean, we, we happily grow grass, we happily grow trees, uh, we have babies, and yet we don't understand everything about how they grow. We only, uh, we only know in uh, me mechanistic form, you take a seed, which is some sort of encapsulated form of magic, you put it in the ground, history says you spread earth over the top of it and you water it for a while, and it turns into whatever. The, the fact that here's one seed and it turns into grass, here's another seed and it turns into a tree, you know, you, we just accept. Babies, you know, they're a miracle, literally a miracle. So that makes them magic. So I think we, we are not isolated from this ourselves. But it does mean that the, thre the incandescent light bulb is about the threshold of, lag of, log threshold of magic for most non-scientific but well-educated people. That's a long way back from where we're working, but that's the, that's the um, thing that we've got to appreciate about other people. They can be very knowledgeable, skilled people, but not in technology, and the assumption that they will have about uh, technology is, the knowledge they will have about it is about that of the light bulb. And this is the incandescent light bulb because that one's easy. <coughs> But we all lose if the public doesn't understand the difference between science and magic because our scientific roles will not be recognized or valued and teaching and research in them will go. Technology jobs will follow because if you don't value them, then why create them? And our society will be, will be dependent on the continued beneficence of others. This is worrying, because if you think we're um, susceptible to supplies of oil, then actually we're way more susceptible to the supplies of this technology. And what's important is, not that we have the ability to do the whole thing in Europe or a particular country, 
but that we are contributing as much as other people so they are as dependent on us as we are dependent on them so we don't want to establish uh, markets where we have absolute dominance because you can't do it what we do want to do is to be involved throughout the whole thing so your value is still appreciated so an employer's perspectives on education then or on recruitment employers really have two uh, requirements because their business is not about employing people it's about doing something so they have really two categories of people that, they're, that they need. The first off is replacement. This is a highly specific need. And a 100% match is probably improbable. Um, now, probably improbable. <laughs> but if you don't ask, you don't get it. Now this is interesting. So an employer will ask for somebody who exactly fits the jigsaw puzzle hole that somebody who used to be there has, has gone, uh, left behind them. They will ask for it, but at the same time they're realistic. So they will accept match key aspects and plan for training and integration. So you know you're not going to find the exact jigsaw puzzle piece, but if you can get one fairly close, that that person can come up to speed fairly quickly, uh, can be trained to, uh, to fit the whole, or indeed the whole can be modified to fit the person because it works both ways round. Over time you get a replacement and ideally you get a replacement which is better. So the reality is something compromised down on that. The second thing that they're looking for is enhancement. This is just growth of the business if you like or change of the business. The needs of an evolving business. Now they either need specific capabilities so this is something larger than that provided by an individual. Um, or they need to reskill people, primarily because of the evolutions of the technology, but occasionally this means that some jobs have ceased to be relevant to that current business in, and the opportunity of developing the devil you know rather than bringing in somebody else uh, to, to fill another role. These are very real requirements. And then there is the general recruitment. These are graduates who are coming into the business they are essentially filling the holes now we've got I've given a picture of the scale of arms business there's a lot of things we're involved in and the graduates will be have the opportunity to go into a lot of different holes generally speaking most companies have an induction scheme these days and during that time the the new graduates will move around key aspects of the business to find out which of them feel more comfortable for them now, to give them that ability, you need them to have a basic engineering scientific knowledge, physics, maths, computer science, and electrical engineering, electronic engineering. Uh, these are, if you like, core backgrounders. If they have no knowledge about that, when they go into any of those departments, they haven't got a clue. Deeper knowledge and experience in a specific area is good, uh, but it's got to be relevant to the business, otherwise it's not, you know, the fact that you've got a master's in cake baking doesn't really help you a lot if you're going to go into microelectronics. Uh, and a team player. You're going to be part of a team. So you've got to get out of your head the idea that you're going to be doing the whole thing. You're not. You're going to be a specialist in part of it. You've got a career in front of you during which you have the opportunity to steer it where it needs to go. But you're going to be part of a team and it's an inevitable part. Engineering flair and enthusiasm are so important. You see people who turn up, they've got their certificates and they effectively say, well, what else do you want? You know, I've got, I've got my certificates, so that's enough. And of course it's not. This is so important. Most people, most employers, don't even look at the certificate beyond the, the fact that they know they've got it. And readiness and willingness to be shaped. And that comes along with the enthusiasm. They see the big picture, they want to be part of this, they'll do this thing, and they will, they will say, is there career growth opportunities? And usually the answer is yes. Do we have plenty of training opportunities? Usually the answer is yes. <coughs> And ability trumps certificates every time. I'm really sad to say this, but certificates don't matter once you're moving. It matters at that stage how well you can do the job. And uh, employers literally will take people, and I've, I've known some of them who've come into uh, 
uh, into the business with no technical qualifications at all, went to a local technical school after leaving school and, um, and, and basically progressed up to be leading IT people in the industry at the moment and I can, I can point you at individuals. Uh, my own history is I left school at 15 with no qualifications so I'm not a million miles from that myself. Um, now this has implications then on the education because logically if you want electronic systems engineers then you educate them, don't you? Well, the answer is no, you don't actually. You need to educate society about electronic systems because they're the ones who are developing the supply. That's where your students are going to come from and if they don't see because their parents don't talk about it, because society doesn't talk about it, if they don't see there's any kind of job opportunity or future in, in this activity for themselves, then they don't go there. This is an important part of the education and it really lines with the, with the, the businesses about um, uh, illustrating that this is science, not, uh, not magic. New engineers are really only trying to get onto the first rung of the ladder and that's an important thing. You're not teaching them to be engineers, you're teaching them to get onto the first rung of the ladder and to be enthusiastic about engineering, to understand the language, to be able to make the transitions that they're going to make through the rest of their career. You don't train them then as electronic systems engineers, you train them to be engineers, good, well-based, well-grounded engineers. Um, they will be working in the electronic systems value network, but it's impossible to teach them to be everything so you have to teach them to be part of a dispersed team in a specific capability. Da 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 da, mentioned all that. And then you've got to look after the professional engineers because these are now climbing the ladder. So it starts probably on year two when they've come out and it continues, broadly speaking, on a two or three year basis. They have significant new things to learn and to evolve into for the rest of their working lives. It's so obvious, actually. It's what I've done, and it's what people around me do. do. They don't do it. Uh, they don't think about it particularly, but it is being done. It's not all formal, but part of it is formal. A lot of it is hands-on, but it's getting out there. It's going to the conferences. It's meeting people. It's talking to people. It's having networks and it's uh, chats and it's um, uh, all of the social media as well as specific training on specific tools. Um, it's staying on the ladder is difficult. Falling off is easy. And it's all too easy for good engineers to drop off the ladder. We don't want that to happen. Again, society needs those engineers to stay there. They're good engineers. Keep them on the ladder. Help them to be there. So I'm getting towards the end. I have no idea how time is going. <clears throat> so that brings me to elitism and the engineering scientist engineer scientist. This is another domain where gift and prowess matters. Um, a few years ago um, our uh, UK won a, um, uh, an Olympic rowing medal. We're so pr proud of our Olympic rowers that they interviewed them on TV and uh, they talked to this guy and they said to him for all of the aspiring Olympic rowers out there um, what would you recommend as the, the basic regime that they should undertake? And this guy said, well the first thing you've got to do is you've got, you've got to choose your parents very carefully. <laughs> and I think that that is something which is kind of acceptable in the physical world. You know, if you've got short mother and short father, chances are you're going to be short. You know, it's not, it's, it's not personal. It's not an insult. to You know, it's just biology. Now, muscles, you know, if you've got a great muscular mother and father, then you're heading down the road of being muscular in, in, and, and aiming at that kind of activity. Why do we think that that only applies to the external physical attributes? Now, whether it's biology or whether it's environment or whether it's early training or not, I don't know. But we, we would reasonably expect that brains are also uh, in some way inherited or the ability to use them, perhaps. Around 3% of the UK population has an engineering degree, that's all of the engineering categories, roughly a fifth of which are electronic, but I uh, can't pin that number down terribly, terribly well. Uh, only about half of them are still employed in engineering and science. Uh, and that's, to put a scale on it, about one person 
out of a secondary education class who's generally a geek. You know, most, most of the rest of the kids think he's a geek. Now imagine, most of the rest of the kids think she's a geek, okay? This is why it's so much more difficult to be a female geek in the class than a male geek. It's bad enough being a male geek. A female geek, you've had it. You're just out of it. And I think that that is one of the big problems that we actually face. As engineers, you were probably one in the class. You might have been two, but statistics are you won't have been a lot. Only a percentage of those will go on to be world-class leaders, probably around 1%, just a guess. The benefits that they bring, however, to local society and the economy are going to be very real. These are people who will assemble clusters around them, who will start businesses around them, who will develop university courses and skill groups and all sorts of things. The opportunity to double or treble their number is very real. There are not that many of them. Society can afford to look after this group if it wanted to. It doesn't want to because it's not fashionable to explain that they're clever. And clever is for somehow, somehow seen as uh, insulting to the rest of the community. I'm, fortunately, I'm not a politician, so that's not my problem. But it is very foolish for countries not to stimulate the economic potential that this 0.03% of the population present. It would be seen, seen to favouring the already favoured, but okay, you know, get over it. So conclusions then. Educating the embedded systems engineers required a three-pronged approach, stimulating the supply, developing the new engineers and developing the professional engineers. Tends to be focused on the middle one, but the other two are very important ones actually. And I think the other point, which is not really part of that, is to encourage the intellectual elitism. Um, and I think I've said all I wanted to say. Indeed I have. Thank you. Thank you.